This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we are coming down to the very, very end of the year. So we've got a couple of, well, actually a few really, really awesome episodes here toward the end. We're going to do our best books of 2022. We're going to do our best podcast of 2022. And then later on this week, probably Friday, we're going to do a wrap up of the entire year. But today we're going to focus on the best books of the year. But before we get into that, just want to remind you, please leave us a positive five-star rating. If you love the show, guys, if you've never given us a rating, whether you listen to us on iHeartRadio or Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever, make sure that you are giving us a thumbs up or five stars or whatever, and leave us a few sentences letting us know why you like our content. And then also, I want you guys to keep on Daunted Life in mind with your end of year giving, because this is that last week where you can do your end of year giving. I know that's on the tip of everybody's brains. You know, we're after Christmas now and all those different things. You're looking at New Year's. You're looking forward to 2023. We would just love for you guys to keep us in mind. We do have a donation page on our website, undaunted.life backslash donate. That is in the show notes, undaunted.life backslash donate. It is in the show notes. Guys, We've gotten some very generous gifts this year and everything that we do costs money and everything that we're looking to expand and do next year, which I can't tell you about yet, but we're getting there. We need funds in order to do all of those things. So that is a great way that you guys can support us. But another great way that you can support us is by supporting the companies that support us. So the main company I want to talk about today is Origin Maine. We've talked about them a lot. So OriginMaine.com or OriginUSA.com. Guys, they make the best jujitsu keys on the planet. They make work boots. They make jeans. They make hunting gear. That's something new they're doing this year. But also in the Jocko Fuel side. They've got Jocko Go, the energy drinks. They've got supplements. They just released creatine. You can check all that out there, guys. And if you want to try out that material, if you want to try out any of the things that they make, go to their website and at checkout, make sure you put in the promo code undaunted, right? So if you can search our name, you can spell it, spell undaunted, get 10% off your order at originmain.com. That is in the show notes. But guys, we're going to do the best books of 2022 right now. I'm very, very excited to bring these to you guys. As I read books throughout the entire year, I'm thinking about this particular episode. Like literally, it's like, okay, I can use that quote whenever I talk about this book later this year. Or, hey, I wonder if that's going to be in kind of my final books of the year list. But this was actually the most prolific year of my entire life for reading. Okay. I read 54 books in the first 11 months of this year. Because in December, you know, I was working on some other things. I'm, I'm reading through a book right now, but I probably won't finish it before the end of the year. But 54 books read in 11 months. Last year was my previous most prolific year personally, and that was 45 books in 12 months. And so to be honest with you, that's probably going to be my high watermark for the rest of my life because, you know, it'd be a lot easier if I said, yeah, these were all like kids books or something. But no, these books were between 200 and 500 pages long. These were actual, you know, full on tangible uh, books, mainly nonfiction, but I just don't see that being possible moving forward. I mean, the amount of reading I did this year to the detriment of almost everything else, because whenever I read these books, it's mainly for interviews, but I'm reading every word that this person has written so that I, I can have that information at my disposal when we go into the interview. But next year, we're going to be doing a little bit less on interviews. And so I'll, I'll explain that later whenever we get more to that. But yeah, very, very uh, good year in terms of how I read. Basically, I read everything on a device. And so like tangible, physical books, they're great. They, they look great on a shelf. Uh, you know, I'm going to show you a bunch of them here in a second, but that is harder for me to read because a lot of times I read when everybody else in the house is asleep. And so like having to have a lamp on or something like that, as opposed to just having the screen dimmed uh, on what I'm reading, but I typically just read on my iPad and I just have everything right there. But also when you have it available to you in digital form, you, you basically have it in your pocket at all times. You basically have it around you at all times where it's not always as convenient to take your book physically with you. And one thing that I always kind of make sure whenever I talk about the best, best books of the year, is I'm preaching to an audience here that is mainly of readers, but I know there's a large segment of all of you that don't read at all. You know, you're one of those guys that, you know, the last book you read was in high school or something like that. And you look at everybody else and you're, you're still that 16 year old kid making fun of the other kid in class for actually having done the homework, actually having, you know, studied for the test, actually having read the book. But guys, one of the best ways that you can, you know, stave off mental deterioration over your life is to read and not just read, you know, fantasy football statistics or read, you know, blogs about your, your favorite sports team and what, you know, 17 year old kid committed to play for them in the fall. Like those, those things are fine, but that's not reading like reading a book is right. Reading through a, an article on your favorite news site is not the same as picking up a book and digging through it because typically a book has a narrative structure, especially if it's a liter literature or fiction or something like that. But then if it's nonfiction, 
there are tangible bits of knowledge in there, whether that's biography or history or, you know, some other philosophical book or something like that. You're able to reckon with the material that is there on the page and it is sharpening you mentally. So when I talk about spiritual, mental and physical resilience, one of the easiest ways to cultivate mental resilience is to read and not just read books that agree with your sensibilities, but read books that come from a myriad of different worldviews and in subject matters that you're not terribly familiar, familiar with. And so again, what a great quote from a friend of mine was there are two types of people in this world. There are people that read and then there are morons. And so I wholeheartedly believe that guys, please do not be a moron. So this is how I'm going to approach the best books of 2022. I'm going to do a little bit differently than I've done other podcasts in the past. So most of the books that I'm going to be talking about are from 2022. Some of them are from past years. And so I'm going to talk about the best books that I read in 2022, even though most of them are from this year. And if one is from a different year, I'll make sure to give you that year. Normally, whenever I've done this particular episode, I've had categories, right? So here's the the most exciting book I read and the most challenging book I read and the most this or that. I'm just not going to do that this year because there were so many ones that I wanted to bring to you that I couldn't think of a pithy category or something like that. So I'm just going to give you a rundown of the best books that I read in 2022. And then at the end, I'm going to give out some actual specific awards. I'm going to give out an award, I guess you can call it that, for the worst book of 2022. My almost best book of 2022 and then my pick for the best book of 2022. So we'll spend some extra time on those guys. You want to most certainly stick around for that for sure. But basically all the books that I'm about to mention to you, uh, all the ones that I mentioned today, except for the worst book of the year, which we'll get to, um, these need to be on your to read book list, right? You, you need to buy these and put them on your shelf. You need to download them on your phone or wherever you read stuff on your, on your, you know, Kindle or something like that. These are all books that I basically give my full endorsement. Now, I'm not endorsing every single thing that is written on every single page of these books, but certainly the the concepts, the overall idea, I, I'm totally here for it, okay? So, drink of water, let's get into it. So, the most read books, uh, or the must read, not most read, but the, the must read books that I read in 2022, I'm just going to give them to you in the order that I read them. And again, we're going to spend a lot more time towards the end. So the first one is this one here. And if you're watching this on Rumble, uh, Rumble or on YouTube, I'm actually showing them on the screen, but it's this book, The Intentional Father, A Practical Guide to Raise Sons of Courage and Character by John Tyson. This was actually released in 2021, but I read it like at the very, very beginning of this year. And so if you want to know a little bit more, and a lot of these people I actually talked to on the show this year, thankfully, but 282, episode 282 of this podcast, that's with John Tyson. It's called The Intentional Father. That will be in the show notes. You guys can check that out. But this literally, like in the subtitle, says it's a practical guide. But for the fathers out there that don't have rites of passage, that aren't following organizations, you know, like ours will be eventually where we provide you these rites of passage materials, this book has a ton of tangible content in it for you to take. Now, there are certain things in this book that I certainly am not going to do with my sons, but they're still good ideas. And the thing about it is like, you can use this book as a starting point, as a jumping off point for building something for your sons. Because again, it's not just about getting your sons raised and out the door alive. It's literally making sure that they are courageous and character filled human beings. And so I think John Tyson did a fantastic job of that in this book. Again, guys, put this on your list, the intentional father, a practical guide to raise sons of courage and character. All right. The next one is with, uh, this is another one that was from 2021 and this one's called the comfort crisis, embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self by Michael Easter. And so we had Michael Easter on episode 285 of this podcast that will be in the show notes, but this details a, you know, a, he basically got to a point in life where, you know, he was drinking a lot. He didn't really like himself. He wasn't working hard on his body or any of those types of things. And we look at kind of how everything coalesced to him eventually going on a very, very weird thing for him, which was a hunt. And he went on a hunt in Alaska and this was on a caribou hunt and he details the entire thing. But again, embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self. Now, the subtitle, you might think like, oh, okay, this is going to be kind of self-helpy. To a degree, it is. But he really details a lot of stuff in here about how we've gotten so comfortable in modernity and how that's deleterious to us, not only individually, but also as a culture. Okay. So guys, if you have not read this book, it is an absolutely fantastic read and it will motivate you to get up and get off your rear end. So again, The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. Okay. Next one here. 
So we had him on the show as well. This is going to be a trend. But this one is uncanceled. Finding meaning and peace in a culture of accusations, shame, and condemnation by the one and only Phil Robertson. So he was on episode 280 of this podcast. It's called Jesus Ducks and Living Uncanceled. So we spend, you know, a little bit of time, you know, digging into the specific points of this book. But the thing that I want to point out about Phil Robertson and his books, because at this point I think I've read three or four of his books, it's simple. Now, some people write simply because they are simple people and that's all they're capable of. But if you sit with Phil Robertson for any length of time, whether in person or listening to him almost, you know, uh, on someone else's show or something like that. So kind of being like a fly on the wall, you know, this guy is a simple man, but he is not simple minded. Okay. There is a ton of wisdom in this very, very short book about how you can operate in a world that wants to cancel you for having biblically based opinions. And if you go back to episode 280 of this podcast, again, all these will be in the show notes. You just watch a man that has the Bible sitting out there in front of him and he just thinks of something and he just flips over to that page of scripture and starts talking about it because the man is marinated in the scriptures. And that comes out in everything that he does. And so when people are pushing back against culture, but they don't have a biblical foundation for that, it becomes fairly vapid. And so that's why I would highly recommend a book like this. This is a book that if you have someone in your family that's not really a big time reader, but maybe they watched Duck Dynasty before, this will give you the you kind of a good, I guess, entry point even to having a gospel conversation with these things. Because that's one thing, no matter what Phil's talking about, no matter what he writes about, the gospel is certainly going to be a part of it. So guys, Uncanceled by Phil Robertson, you should pick that up, put it on your list. All right, next one here, The Way Forward. Master Life's Toughest Battles and Create Your Lasting Legacy by Robert O'Neill and Dakota Meyer. And so they were on uh, back-to-back episodes 286 and 287. Robert O'Neill, this is the guy that killed Osama bin Laden, you know, former SEAL Team 6 member. And then Dakota Meyer, a uh, retired Marine who won the Medal of Honor. And guys, I-, I did this book, but I also read both of their autobiographies again this year. And so Into the Fire by Dakota Meyer and then The Operator by Robert O'Neill. Those are a couple of extra bonus ones that you should certainly put on your list. But this book, has a lot of the same stories and Robert and Dakota kind of go back and forth. They switch off chapter by chapter. So this one is a very approachable book. It's not going to strike you as kind of a military memoir. This is mainly like leadership lessons that come from a couple of guys that did some pretty crazy things when they were in the military, some pretty impressive things, but have continued to do those things after they left the military, not the same types of things, obviously, but they've been able to continue their leadership journey and to spread their message to people all over the globe. I have a ton of respect for, for Robert and Dakota. I've actually been able to spend quite a bit of time with Dakota uh, when I was down in Texas a couple of months ago, but a fantastic, fantastic read. So the way forward by Robert O'Neill and Dakota Meyer. All right, next one here. This is a very unique book because it's really the only book that I've read like this ever in my entire life. It's called black ops, the life of a CIA shadow warrior by Rick Pro. And so Rick Prado was on episode 312 of this podcast. It's called The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. And the thing about this is this is a guy that is one of the most respected people in the intelligence community. Um, And now he's retired from the CIA, but he's still in the intelligence community. He's just a deeply respected man because this dude was about it. Like anytime there was something crazy, it didn't matter how potentially hot the circumstance or situation was going to be. This guy was in the middle of it. And this details not only, you know, growing up, uh, you know, poor in the United States as an immigrant and kind of what it was like whenever he left his family, you know, his mom and dad for the first time and what it looked like, you know, as he kind of found his way to the CIA. And I really enjoyed talking to him about it. And he and I've had a couple of phone conversations even since then, but it's a very, very unique book to put on your shelf because a lot of you guys have read a lot of the military memoirs, especially from the global war on terror. But this is something where you're watching a guy that his his career you know spanned certainly the global war on terror in 9-11 and all that, but goes way back to stuff that was happening all over the world and things that you certainly have heard about. So this book is definitely worth your, worth your time. I think Rick absolutely knocked it out of the park with this. So Black Ops by Rick Prado is another one. So I'm going to take a little break here. Got to have a sip of tea. I tell you guys, I have voice problems. This is how we keep it going. So the next book here is by the one and only John Eldridge. It's called Resilient, Restoring Your Weary Soul in These Turbulent Times. He was on episode 317 of this podcast. I think that was his fourth appearance on this podcast. Again, that'll be in the show notes. But this is another very short book by John Eldridge. And the thing about it is he's very attuned to things that are happening in culture that are on kind of a different wavelength than other people. He's attuned to kind of the, the emotional changes that are happening in people, the, the, the almost, 
I don't know, the, the, the feelings of different people, like something that, you know, a guy like me maybe has a little bit harder thing realizing or, or looking at, but he saw what happened in 2020 and not just with the things that happened in our government and things that happened all over the world, but what that did to people and what it revealed about people. And it did make people very, very weary. And again, resilient, resilience. Those are my, like my favorite words in the English language. This is a book that kind of helps you understand, okay, this is the time that we're in. Nothing's slowing down. Things are only getting more complicated. Things are only getting more difficult to deal with, but that's not an excuse to tap out. Like this is your excuse to overcome and to be a resilient person. This is why I talk about spiritual, mental, and physical resilience all the time. He didn't write a book called strong or strength because he knows better. He knows that that is something that will wane over time, regardless of who you are and how well-trained you are. Resilience is something different. That is the ability to bounce back. We talk about it all the time. So guys, you should definitely check this book out. Resilient by John Eldridge. Okay, next one here. So um, the next one is a one that I actually don't have a physical copy of, but it's called The Manliness of Christ, How the Masculinity of Jesus Eradicates Effeminate Christianity. And this is by Dale Partridge. So he came on episode 321 of this podcast to talk about this particular book. This book is really, really small. I mean, of all the books that I read this year, that wasn't a book that I read to my kid. I think this was the shortest book. It was, I think it was under 100 pages. But this details the overall concept of the manliness of Jesus Christ. Now, this is something that I talk about often when I'm invited to come and speak to uh, men's groups or to other organizations or something like that. I talk about the masculinity and manliness of Jesus Christ. That is something that I talk about often. I try to make people understand that when they're worshiping at the feet of Jesus, they're worshiping at the feet of a very, very manly man. And not how we've defined masculinity and manliness in modern parlance necessarily, but in a lot of different ways, in the perfect ways, because he is the perfect, you know, you know, one third member of the Godhead, as you could call it. But Dale Partridge did a, a great job on this book. I think he was a little surprised at the the reception that it got, how positive it was received. He had to do, you know, multiple uh, more printings of it and get it out to even more people. But it's, it's certainly well worth your time. It, Again, it's a short read. This is a good book to buy for somebody in your life that, you know, you might buy a copy of Wild at Heart for, right? Maybe this is a person that it feels a little bit uncomfortable at church. And I've gotten some, uh, you know, reviews recently by women that listen to this podcast or, or people that like, they don't understand why their man's not really into church that much, why he doesn't really like the sermon content, why he doesn't really like the description of Jesus and how he's portrayed in, in songs and artwork and something like that. I think if you buy him this book, that it's going to give you a little bit of a hint as to why that is. So again, guys, The Manliness of Christ by Dale Partridge. So next one here, this is probably going to be an annual thing here, but it is In the Blood by Jack Carr. So this is the fifth of his James Reese novels. That's episode 309 of this podcast. He came on to talk about uh, In the Blood and a bunch of other things. So 2022 was a banner year for Jack Carr. I mean, big time banner year for Jack Carr because not only did he release another successful novel, you know, he's a number one New York Times bestselling author, author multiple times over, but they released The Terminalist on Amazon Prime with Chris Pratt. And it, it's my understanding that it was one of the most viewed streaming any things of the year. It just did incredibly well. It was a, a very, very rough and, and dark series. And I think that lent itself to the content. But basically, Jack is finding ways to push the character James Reese without turning him into Superman, because this is supposed to be just a normal guy. This was a guy that was a Navy SEAL that is now no longer a Navy SEAL that is going through all these crazy circumstances. Again, no spoilers here. But if you followed along with with what we see here, what you've seen with a lot of other series is where you have these people that are, you know, they start out as a Green Beret or they start out as, you know, retired this or that. Then they, they kind of turn into a superhero. They're doing things that are just so crazy, things that they would have never been trained to do in the military, but magically they know how to like stop a nuclear weapon from exploding or something like that. But that's one thing about Jack Carr is he's pushing the James Reese character along. He's pushing the narrative along, but you can tell he has an idea of where this is going. And we spent a lot of time in episode 309 talking about that specifically. So guys, every year that he releases a novel, which is basically once a year, it's probably going to end up on this list because, you know, he's seemingly getting better at it every time he writes one. All right, let's go to the next one here. So this one is from my buddy, the one and only Eddie Penny. And so it is Unafraid, Staring Down Terror as a Navy SEAL and Single Dad. Um, so I got to be on his show, uh, the Unafraid podcast earlier this year where we talked about this book. And he actually gave me this signed copy with uh, this coin and everything in it. So challenge coin. So that's a pretty awesome thing. 
He came on our show to talk about it. We did a double episode with him. So episode 336 and 337 to talk, talk specifically about some of the stuff in this book. I, I really like this book for a lot of uh, different reasons. Uh, it's a very raw book. He doesn't always portray himself in the most positive light, which is always refreshing for a uh, you know memoir, which you know we'll get more into another example of that a little bit later. You know, I am mentioned in this as somebody that he says has kind of helped him uh, towards Christ. And, you know, he kind of goes into all those, those different characteristics here. But the thing about this book that I like so much is that Eddie Penny is a very exceptional guy. He's done some very exceptional things in his career. Again, he was a member of Development Group, which is the top tier, you know, top 1% of the Navy SEAL community. To even get into that community is a fairly, you know, ridiculous uh, order. It's a very, very tall order to get into that. But he did that for a very long time. Um, and he was able to keep his family together. He was able to to still have a relationship with his kids. He goes into some some craziness that happened with uh, you know the, the mother of his children and some things that go into this book. But every time I hear the guy talk about his life again, this is one of the baddest dudes to ever walk the face of the earth. Okay, but even in that. He's telling you where he went wrong. He's telling you where he made mistakes. He's telling you where he doesn't come off looking real shiny. Because that's one thing about some military memoirs that I've read that I haven't mentioned on the show and haven't mentioned on purpose is that these people always come out looking like the hero. Like they never come out where they made a mistake, where they missed the shot, any of those types of things. But Eddie is very, very apparent in, you know, you're not having to surmise or read between the lines on the stuff that he's doing in terms of, hey, there, here are the mistakes that I made and here's where I've messed up. And this is a guy that when he speaks, he can almost never get through his speech without crying because he's not because he's a wuss, obviously, but it's, it's literally because he's done some things in his life that he still feels shame over. But he also understands the grace of Jesus to an almost extreme degree that most people don't quite understand. So this book is certainly well worth your time. Unafraid, Staring Down Terror as a Navy SEAL and Single Dad by Eddie Penny. All right, next one here. So this book, if I would have had the category, a most challenging book that I read in 2022, this is certainly going to be it. Now, this is actually a book from 2021. It's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution by Carl Truman. So Carl came on this episode or on this podcast, rather on episode 347. And we talked a lot about this book. Now, guys, I've said before, and it's just kind of a joke, but if, you know, my intellect, intellectual ability was a toaster, I couldn't lightly toast a piece of bread. I'm not sure I've ever read a book where I felt dumber afterwards. And that is not, you know, a dig on Carl Truman. It is meant to be a compliment about his book because this book is incredibly dense. This is a book that you could spend all year on, literally. You could just reread chapters or reread individual segments of this book and just chew on it. I think this is a, a book that Ben Shapiro has said is the best book written in the last 10 years or something like that. And it's certainly one of the best books that you will potentially ever read. It is on our book list on our website, the 100 books every modern Christian man should read this. And so, the, and it's for good reason because this is going to push you, but it's also going to go way farther back than what you realize. Because for a lot of us, we're like, oh, you know, there's this craziness with LGBTQ and the normalization of pedophilia and all this woke stuff and the drag queen story hours, all these different things. And we assume that that's a new thing. We assume that that just happened within the last couple of election cycles. But he details how far back it goes and it goes back farther than you can possibly imagine. Guys, this is not an easy book, which should encourage you to want to read it. Just because it's a hard book doesn't mean you should avoid it, okay? Because if you're going to do that, just read a bunch of, you know, Goosebumps books from like back when you were a kid. But this book is well worth your time, but it will take some time. Now, I had to read it fairly quickly because, you know, I had a deadline uh, for my interview with Carl Truman. I want to have him back on. We're, we're working on that to have him back on because we didn't even scratch the surface in our interview really about some of the tangible things about this book. But guys, this book is well, well, well worth your time. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truitt. All right, next book here, uh, Shane by Jack Schaefer. So this book was written in 1946, okay? Now, as I tell you guys all the time, I basically read nonfiction. Okay. Fiction, you know, it's harder, it's hard for me to follow typically, especially the, the really complicated fiction where there's so many different characters and different timelines that are moving around. And it's just like, you know, I, I can't really get into that. It's not really for me. I'd rather watch a movie or, you know, a short film or something like that. If I just want to be entertained or something like that. But every year I do read a handful. I can count on one hand, the number of fiction books that I read, but I saw a gap in the book list that I have. So I have a literature, you know, page. I didn't have any Westerns. I didn't have any books that were kind of Western in nature. I guess the close would be, you know, uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer or something like that. And I had heard that Shane was the best Western, the, the best book, Western book 
that you could possibly read. Okay. So I was sold on that, you know, in the last several years, I've gotten very, very much so into Westerns, not really old Western movies, but kind of the new modern Western movies and just, you know, Oregon trail and different things that kind of went on as we expanded out West. Um, this book is absolutely fantastic. Okay. Now, as I tell you all the time, fiction is great for audiobooks, and, you know, or you can just read it yourself, but this is one that I listen to on audio. Because when I'm listening to a story, it's a lot easier for me to keep the people straight and kind of keep the story straight and where we're going. Very, very simple uh, read or listen. Very, very fast. But Shane by Jack Schaefer, you guys should definitely check that out. All right. Another one that I listened to this year on audio that I think is well worth your time is one that's been on my book list for forever, but I never got around to it. And that's Endurance. Shackleton's Incredible Voyage by Alfred Lansing. And this is from 1959. And so this goes specifically into the voyage to the South Pole that Ernest Shackleton did. It goes into how he recruited the men to go down there when their ship got stuck in the ice, basically when they had to leave the ice, how they were able to keep each other alive, you know, the different rescue missions that they went on. And gosh, it is you, you listen to a book like that, or you read a book like that and you realize how exactly soft you are. Now you might do jujitsu and you might, you know, camp a few times a year and you might work out when it's cold outside or any of that. But then you listen to what these men did to try and survive and you realize, wow, I suck. I'm the worst. Like, I'm basically a child. That is what this book will do for you. But it's good to also remember that even in a bygone era, there were men that would do things to just push the boundaries of understanding so much so that they would risk their lives in order to do it. Guys, Endurance by Alfred Lansing, well, well, well worth your time. All right, let's get back to the ones that I physically have in front of me. Christianity and Wokeness, how the social justice movement is hijacking the gospel and the way to stop it. This is actually from 2021. Owen Strand was on episode 361 of this podcast. Very, very well-received episode. We'll certainly talk more about that episode when we talk about my best podcast of the year. But there's a lot of confusion within Christendom about wokeness and about how much of wokeness should be embraced by people, how much of it should be used as a lens through which we view the world or something like that. But one thing that people need to understand and one thing that Owen Strand points out is that Christianity and wokeness, they are oil and water. They cannot be mixed together. You cannot use wokeness, which comes from an atheistic ideology, ultimately, and he details that in the book. It does not jive with a Judeo-Christian ethic, and it certainly does not jive with the gospel. This is another difficult book, book, but it's a short book, but it gives you some of the language around like, okay, how did we get here? Why are people saying the things that they're saying right now? Certainly, certainly well worth your time. Again, guys, the book is Christianity and Wokeness by Owen Strand. Now we're going to get into another great book that we had this year, uh, one that I actually don't. Okay, I don't have a physical one of this either, but this is well worth your time. Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas. Actually, I do. I just left it over there on that shelf, but I won't leave. I won't get it. You guys can check it out yourself. It is in the show notes. Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas. So episode 364 of this podcast, we talked to Eric about this particular book. And so this is a great book for you to read after you've read Bonhoeffer. Okay, now you can read this as a standalone, and I certainly would recommend that you do so. But if you read his biography of Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is on our 100 books list on our website, this is like almost like a capstone to that book about basically what happened in the 1930s in Germany that allowed the Nazis to rise up. And yes, I do mean allowed because that party was allowed to come to power because people look back at the world war two era. They look back at the, the time in between world war one and world war two and what was going on in Germany. And they just assume that, you know, Hitler basically did a bait and switch. And he rose to power and people could have stopped it, but, you know, maybe they didn't. But one of the things that he points out that is absolutely haunting in this book, again, it's a very short read, well worth your time, is that there were a few thousand German pastors, okay, leaders of churches, that had they stood up against the Nazi party, the Holocaust would have never happened. World War II would have never happened. Now, we, we can't know, because we don't live in a parallel universe, we can't know what would have happened had the Nazis not risen to complete power and began to push uh, all over Europe and all those different things. We can't know what would have happened. But there's the potential that if a few thousand, just a few thousand of German pastors that had the stones to stand up to the pressure from the Nazi party, party that tens of millions of people would not have died. Tens of millions 
because that's how many people died during World War II. Tens of millions of people. And then from there, maybe we don't get the USSR, okay? Maybe, maybe we don't have the Maoist revolutions in China. Maybe Pol Pot's not really a thing. But because of World War II and because people were following the Nazi playbook, this is basically what happened. This is essentially where the, this, this level of power was shown to have, have worked to, to a large degree and that other people should try and do it. And so Eric Metaxas is sounding the alarm for people, especially in the church, that are just asleep at the wheel. These people that are using critical race theory in their sermon preparation saying, yeah, you know, I, I know it's, you know, fruit of the poisonous tree here, but we should just use it as a lens through which to view uh, the plight of the American black man or, or something like that. Or, you know, they're like, yeah, we need to be, you know, nice to our people, right? Even if they use pronouns that don't align with truth, we should just use those pronouns because it's, it's nice and it's neighborly of us to do, right? And Eric Metaxas is basically saying, if you do that, you are doing exactly what these supposedly Christian pastors in the 1930s in Germany were doing. They were just whistling past the graveyard. So guys, you should certainly pick up a copy of this Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas. Now, another book that's kind of in the same vein of the endurance book that I talked about earlier, which is another book that I listened to on audio this year, is Skeletons of the Zahara, A True Story of Survival by Dean King. This was actually released in 2004. This is another story of unbelievable survival. So I guess I covered both spectrums. I have people trying to survive uh, in the desert and then people trying to survive in the Antarctic. And so the thing about it that is so interesting about this book is this book presents a story of these American sailors, these white American sailors that were enslaved by uh, Muslims in Africa. Okay, so uh, their their ship crashed off the coast of the, the west coast of Africa, and then they're captured, enslaved, and sold around, and you know traded for camels and different things like that. But it, it's another thing that shows you how just unbelievably weak you are, and how you, you would probably not have survived if you were born, you know, a hundred or two hundred years ago. But it's just an interesting thing to see how steely the resolve, especially of the captain of the ship that went down, how his resolve kept him going through this entire situation. Okay. And I'll basically leave it there. That's another book like endurance. That's another good one. That would be a good one to listen to because typically when I'm reading books, I'm, you know, taking notes or highlighting, but on that one, you're just basically following a narrative of people that are, you know, doing everything that they can to survive. So skeletons on the Zahara by Dean King, again, released in 2004. All right, the next one here is one that I actually lent out, so I have somebody borrowing it right now, but it's The Boy Crisis, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It by Warren Farrell. This is from 2018. So Warren Farrell was on our podcast, episode 376, and we talked about the boy crisis. We talked about what's happening with young men in our culture, how they're being othered, how they're being put in these separate categories, how we are basically not catering to the boys in our culture, and we're assuming that our culture will be able to survive, okay? Okay. Now, if you listen to that interview I did with Warren Farrell and any time that he's talked, you know, whether he's been on Jordan Peterson's show or anybody else's show, he's he's trying to be a blinking neon sign saying, you've got to stop this. You've got to turn things around. So there are certainly things inside the book that you can look at and say, okay, this is why this is happening. But then he's very prescriptive, not just descriptive about what we should do if we want the boys in our culture to grow up to be strong morally good boys. It goes back to the thing that I was talking about with the intentional father with John Tyson is a lot of boys just don't end up being courageous and having character. It's something they have to be taught. And if they're not being taught that because they're worried about so many of these other different things, or if they're being encouraged to become girls, which is what's happening in a lot of our, you know, government run schools right now, that's something that we need to absolutely fight against. And again, this book was written in 2018, which seems like ancient history, especially when it comes to the transing of our children and the normalization of pedophilia. But guys, again, that book is well worth your time. Again, written in 2018, The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell. Another one that I would recommend to you is Seasons of Sorrow, The Pain of Loss and the Comfort of God by Tim Challies. So he was on episode 379 of this podcast. So this podcast is basically a book where he's detailing the things that he was writing in his journal for the first year after his college age son suddenly died. Okay. So uh, I think even to this day, they don't know exactly why his son, uh, his son's heart stopped beating and, uh, he just, you know, didn't start beating again. And, but he's going through everything. And as a father of two young sons, I mean, multiple times I was reading this book, I was just crying, just sitting there in the floor of my office, just crying 
at the thought of what this man is going through, losing his son after he had spent all this time and effort getting him to where he's basically an adult that loves Jesus. He was engaged to a young lady at the time, but this gives you some insight into what is going through the mind of a dad that is mourning at that exact time. So guys, well, well, well worth your time. Tim Challey's Seasons of Sorrow released this year. And then there's another book that Tim Challey's was a part of. This was back in 2019. It's called A Visual Theology Guide to the Bible, Seeing and Knowing God's Word. This is by Tim Challey's and Josh Byers. So this is, you know, I'll just kind of show a little bit on screen. You can kind of see it's like one big, long infographic. Okay, so there's a bunch of, you know, really awesome things. But I, I will tell you, for somebody that that knows quite a bit about the Bible, which I do, as I'm reading through this, I was like, holy cow. And again, this is like an infographic. Everybody's read an infographic or a white paper that you can dig through, and it's very visually appealing. But this book has helped has helped me learn so much and respect so much more about what the Bible is, how we got it today, and also to have even more reverence for it. Because we live in a culture where we have a stack of Bibles sitting on our desk or some bookshelf somewhere that we don't even read. But to understand the plight that people went through just to get the Bible in modernity, it's incredible. So you should know about it. So again, guys, a visual theology guide to the Bible by Tim Challies and Josh Byers. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about before we get into my worst book, the almost best book and the best books of 2022 is The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. And this was released in 2001. So this is on our book list on our website, but it was another book that I hadn't really gotten to. It was just something that was recommended to me. And I just got to tell you, it is one of the most incredible books that I've absorbed in my entire life. So I listened to the audio on this one. I had a bunch of long drives and some travel that I needed to do. And so I was able to, to knock that out because I think it was like 22 or 23 hours worth. But, you know, I do listen at two times speed. So I was able to chop that in half. But Theodore Roosevelt is one of the most incredible human beings that's ever existed. I, I truly believe that. Certainly don't co-sign everything he ever said and did. But if you were to just take out a year, any year of his life that he was alive, in that one year, he will have lived more than the majority of people on the planet will live in their entire life, 60, 70, 80 years plus. He, he tried to cram and did cram so much living into a very, very short period of time. And so this is part of a three book series by Edmund Morris. But this basically goes from the birth of Theodore Roosevelt to right before he ran for president. OK, and you might think to yourself, well, you know, I want to know about President Roosevelt. Well, well there's another one I think that's uh, called Theodore Rex and uh, Colonel Roosevelt. There, there's a couple more in this that I haven't gotten to quite yet. But if you like American history, if you like Americana, if you like American presidents, if you like stuff about the 18th uh, or the 1800s or the 1900s or something like that, like this is so unbelievably for you, like. If you're a good American, you can't be a great American unless you read this book or listen to this book. So The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. Okay, so guys, as we work towards the end here, we're going to get into my three actual, actual like named awards here. But the very first one, and we just got to kind of get this out of the way, it is the worst book of 2022. And if you guys have been listening to my show this year, this is not going to be a surprise to you at all. That book is Attached to God, A Practical Guide to Deeper Spiritual Experience by Crispin Mayfield. So I'm actually going to read the description of the book here. We all experience moments when God's love and presence are tangible, but we also experience feeling utterly abandoned by God. Why? The answer is found when you take a deep look at the other important relationships in your life and understand your attachment style. Through his years working in trauma recovery programs, extensive research into attachment science, and personal experiences with spiritual striving and abuse, licensed therapist Crispin Mayfield has learned to answer the question, why do I feel so far from God? When you understand your attachment style, you gain a whole new paradigm for a secure and loving relationship with God. You'll gain insights about how you relate to others, both your strengths and weaknesses, the practical exercises you can use to grow a secure spiritual attachment to God, how to motivate or how to move forward on the spirituality spectrum and experience the divine connection we are all created for. You'll learn to identify and remove mixed messages about closeness with God that you may have heard in church or from well-meaning Christians. With freedom from the past, you can then chart a new path toward intimate connection with the God of the universe. So one of the most talked about episodes that we did this year was episode 284 of this podcast with Crispin Mayfield, where we dig into this book. Now, the reason why this book is terrible and why it's the worst book that I read this year is because when you read that, that general description, there's a few words in there and phrases that you're like, eh, that's a little bit weird. But when I was pitched this book, I was like, oh, there's probably enough there. I've never really thought about my attachment style. I don't exactly know what that is. So I'll give it a go. 
But the thing about this book is this book is basically a magnum opus from somebody that has allowed what he deems to be abuse, which, you know, I guess the jury's out on whether or not he was actually abused growing up. But to allow your abuse to define who you are, but also to constantly be depending on other people's feelings about you for you to feel worthy yourself. Now, if we were to take this just in the realm of humanism, right? If you're constantly looking to family members, coworkers, loved ones, friends, acquaintances to validate who you are as a person, that's dangerous. But especially if you claim to be a Christian, if you allow those things to define you, but then extrapolate that out to the God of the universe and feel like the God of the universe is constantly mad at you and it's making you sad and all these different things, man, that is just, that's crazy. That is literally crazy. Now, this guy is very, very left wing. I think his, you know, the church he goes to is in Portland. There's a female pastor of the church. This is a guy that, you know, has his pronouns in his bio, has, you know, LGBTQ flag in his bio and all that says he's LGBTQ affirming and all that. So, you know, you can kind of get an idea of who he, who he is, but Doing the interview, and I'll talk more about this on the, the next episode, but doing the interview, it's like, okay, I'm trying to traverse and understand where this guy's coming from without just filling in all the blanks with stuff that I assume, and that's what I tried to do. And unfortunately, it just, uh, I thought it went well at the time, but didn't go well afterwards. And if you go back to episode 284 of the podcast, at least listen to the intro because I get into that. But I want to do my favorite quotes from all these different books, but um that this is, I guess, my favorite quote because it just points out some of the heresy from this nonsense book. Okay, so to set up this short quote, he talked about in the book about waking up one day feeling like God was disgusted with him. Okay, so could that possibly not be coming from God? Is it potentially that that Satan is telling him, oh, I'm disgusted with you or something like that? More on that in a second. And then his wife, which poor lady, you know, <laughs> she brought this on herself, I guess. She suggested that he go to a nearby Catholic garden, a Catholic church that had a garden to clear his head. He sees a statue of Mary holding the baby Jesus in this garden. And then he says that God spoke to him and said, and this is a quote from the book, that's like you and me. You can cry on my chest whenever you need. Okay. So seems fine enough, right? You know, the God is the God of comfort. That makes perfect sense. But then he claims that God told him this again, quoting from the book, I'm your mother now, and you can cry on my chest whenever you need. I know you're so tired and sad and feel so bad about yourself. So, as I pointed out in the interview to him, it's deeply heretical to talk about the God of the universe as a she. Now, obviously, we know that God is outside of labels, you know, right? So he exists in anything and everything. So to reduce him to a he or a she or a whatever is kind of silly. But every time that we see God described in the Bible, he's described in a masculine way and with masculine pronouns. And if you think that, you know, Jesus is the son of God, right? Then then you have to assume that there's a bunch of maleness happening in that moment. And as I said in the interview, I said, is it possible that you weren't hearing the whispers from God in that moment, but you were hearing the whispers of Satan? That Satan could potentially be telling you, hey, uh, uh, God's just your mother now. Because that's just a little lie wrapped in some other truths, right? You know, you wake up feeling like God's disgusted with you. Is a potential? Is there some potential that it's, Satan that gave you that idea and not God, that God's not actually disgusted with you, that he sent his son to this planet so that you could have a way to the father. Is that even possible? So on no planet and under no circumstances, do I suggest that any of you read this book attached to God by Chris Mayfield is easily the worst book that I read this year. Now there was a running gun battle for a second there between him and Ryan George, uh, and you know, for, for worst book of the year and worst, you know, podcast interview experience of the year, but you know, far and above, far and away attached to God by Chris Mayfield, worst book of 2022. So now I need to do my almost the best book of 2022. And so here's the thing with these last two books is for the last several months, I knew these two books were in a, and were basically going to be one or the other was going to be my favorite book of 2022, but I can't stand when people ride the fence. I can't stand when people are like, Oh, this is my one a, and this is my one B, but these feel like one a and one B to me, but I had to pick a favorite. And so I went ahead and did so, but this was my almost the best book of 2022. And it's if the tomb is empty, why the resurrection means anything is possible by Joby Martin. So I just got to tell you right from the jump, and obviously I've talked about him a lot on this show, and you know I've told you that he and I have become friends, but he is one of my favorite people that I've met and befriended because of this show. Maybe my favorite person I've ever met and befriended because of my show, but let me go ahead and read a description of this book, and then we'll get more into it here. 
The Son of God was crucified, died, and buried, and he lay in the tomb for three days until he walked out shining like the sun. In a culture in which history is erased or rewritten at will, the existence of an empty tomb matters. Why? Because if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. In his first book, Joby Martin, lead pastor of the Church of 1122, dives deep into Scripture and traces the story of salvation by highlighting the seven mountains throughout Scripture where God manifests himself. As he describes each encounter with God, Martin shows us how the interaction on each mountain laid the groundwork for the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary and shows what God revealed about himself in the process. He illuminates seven familiar passages, unveiling how God's plan for Christ's sacrifice is threaded throughout Scripture and shows why Christ's resurrection impossible, unbelievable, means that nothing is too hard for our God. Ultimately, he asks readers, do you live every day of your life as if the tomb is empty or as though Jesus is still hanging on the cross? Written with New York Times bestselling author Charles Martin, if the tomb is empty is an insightful and spiritually rich examination of what the miracle of Christ's resurrection means for all of us. So go back to episode 307 of this podcast. That was Joby Martin's first appearance on the show. And guys, every time I'm pitched a book, every time I'm pitched an interview, I take the pitch seriously. And, you know, as years have, uh, you know, worn on, I, I take less and less of those pitches or I accept less and less of those pitches. But there was enough in the pitch for Joby Martin. I can't even remember who sent me the pitch initially. There was no, enough there to where I was like, oh, this might be fine. And then it turned into one of the best interviews that we've ever done on this entire podcast. That's episode 307 of this podcast, Joby Martin, If the Tomb is Empty. But why it's the almost best book of 2022 is because I learned so much while reading this book and it far exceeded what I was expecting because what I was expecting is a mega church pastor book because Joby Martin, as we've talked about, uh, certainly on, on my first interview with him, but then a lot on my second interview with him is he is a mega church pastor. He's a, he's a lead pastor of an enormously big church that by, by all, you know, uh, measurements and whatever could be considered in the category of mega church. And if you've read any books by mega church pastors, my goodness, like, they're based, they're self-help books. It's very much so like their sermons, right? You know, it's these Ted talks. It's these, you know, these, you can do it and God's for you. And you know, you can do all the things you want to do just because blah, blah, blah. And then they just sprinkle a few verses on top and then they call it good. And they're, they're vapid. They're, they're largely meaningless. You're not learning anything. You just have a couple more quotable things that you can throw out the next time you do brunch with somebody and you're, you know, having a discussion over avocado toast, avocado toast. But the thing about this is that's not what this book is at all. You get the practical nuggets, you get the practical knowledge, but the level of stuff that I apparently miss when I read the Bible is astoundingly high, and Joby basically smacked me across the face with it, and I never thought about the mountains of Scripture. I'm a mountains guy. I don't want to ever see a beach again for the rest of my life. The sand is stupid, and the sun lives there, and I'm going to get sunburned, and I don't want to go, right? I want to be in the mountains. I want to be with the evergreens. I want to be with the wildlife. That's where I want to be, right? Right? And so to kind of bring these very, very important mountains from Scripture and to break the book down that way and to understand that this sacrifice that happened thousands of years before Jesus is the same mountain that Jesus was crucified on. And like, I, I don't want to give away too much. I do want to get into some of my favorite quotes. I couldn't find one favorite quote, so forget you guys. I know I just said, you know, you can't, you know, be on the fence there, but I'm going to be on the fence. I have three quotes that I want to go through here. So this first one is from the prologue. So let me press you. This is a gut check. Do you live every day of your life as if the tomb is empty or as though Jesus is still hanging on that cross? Okay, so obviously you, you heard that from the description. But reading that in the prologue, I was like, okay, okay. Like, I like when people, because how many times does someone say, this is going to be a gut check, and then what they ask you is not really a gut check question. It's just like super basic down the middle. But it's like, okay, here's your gut check question. And then it was like, ooh. And then I'm like, crap, do I live like the tomb is empty or do I live like Jesus is still up there? Yeah. So that's tough. And that from the very beginning, you're kind of being put on the defensive, like, hey, I really need to think about this. Now, here's another quote from chapter four. This is called, this is from the chapter Mount of the Be uh, Beatitudes. Our problem is that we don't understand what the word means. It rhymes with weak. He's talking about meekness here. It rhymes with weak, and it's usually used in the phrase meek and mild, so we don't understand it. But the word meek in Greek means a bit bridled horse. It doesn't mean weak at all. It means guided strength. A big, powerful horse is not weak. He's just handed over the reins to his master. The horse yielded his will to the will of the one who can direct his energies for his purposes. Now, guys, I'm obviously obsessed with the uh, original understanding of the word meekness. When I talk about the masculinity and manhood of Jesus, I talk about meekness often. And so this is probably the best paragraph, you know, uh, summary of why we got the word 
wrong over all these years, but specifically what it's meant to be. So I love that quote. And the last quote I'll go through here is from chapter six, the Mount of Transfiguration. Here's the quote. Well, you should write this down, especially if you're a millennial or younger, which, you know, guilty millennial here. Fairness is not a biblical value. God does what he wants with whom he wants when he wants. Why? Because he's the sovereign king of the universe. That reality should comfort you more than it ruffles you because he is good. I mean, dude, you could do an entire sermon just on that right there. Because again, you're speaking to the young people. You're speaking to Gen Zers and millennials, right? You're talking about fairness and where we don't get this concept of fairness from the scripture. Again, a lot of very unfair things happen to followers of Christ, right? A lot of very unfair things happen to the, the people of God, happen to the Jews in the Old Testament. Like a lot of unfair things happen, but God is for him. Again, the Bible's not about you. The, the Bible was given to you as a gift to where you could understand God, kind of, right? To where you could understand the sacrifice of Jesus as a propitiation for your sins, right? But you don't understand God. But the thing that you do need to understand, because you can't understand him in his totality, is that he is good. It goes back to you know what C.S. Lewis wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia, where they're talking about Aslan, who is the God figure of those novels, where it's like, you know, is he safe? It's like, no, he's not safe, but he's good. And and that's what you want. Like you want sheep dogs around you. You want a bunch of guys around you that are very, very unsafe guys, but are good to go back to the quote from chapter four. They are meeked individuals that they have their energies and their aggression and their everything yielded to the will and the purposes of the father. That's what you want. So guys, I, again, I cannot recommend this book anymore. It was almost the best book of 2022. Again, this is my one B if I were to do such a thing, if the tomb is empty by Joby Martin, the almost best book of 2022. But now we've made it all the way in. We're almost an hour in at this point. Here's your payoff. This is what I consider to be the best book of 2022, and it is Scars and Stripes, an unapologetically American story of fighting the Taliban, UFC warriors, and myself by Tim Kennedy, and also by Nick Palmashano. So as you guys know, if you followed on you know our social media or if you listen to us for any length of time, uh, you know I've talked about Tim Kennedy and the friendship he and I have been able to forge, and also with Nick Palmashano, uh, you know Diesel Jack and those different things. But fantastic book. Let me go ahead and read the description to it here. Tim Kennedy has a problem. He only feels alive right before he's about to die. Kennedy, a Green Beret, decorated Army sniper and UFC headliner, has tackled a bull with his bare hands, jumped out of airplanes, dove to the depths of the ocean, and traveled the world hunting poachers, human traffickers, and the Taliban. But he's also the same man who got kicked out of the police department, fire department, and as an EMT before getting two women pregnant four days apart, and finally been beaten up by his special forces colleagues for, quite simply, being a selfish a-hole. In Scars and Stripes, Kennedy describes how the these failures shaped him into the successful businessman and devoted husband and father he is today. Through unbelievably vivid, wild anecdotes, Kennedy reveals all the dumb, violent, embarrassing, and undeniably heroic things he's done in his life, including multiple combat missions in Afghanistan, building a school in Texas for elementary kids, and creating two multi-million dollar businesses. You will learn that failure isn't the end. Rather, it's the first step towards unearthing the best version of yourself and finding success, no matter how overwhelming the setbacks may feel. So I talked to Tim about this particular book on episode 316 of this podcast. It's actually a part one. And yes, guys, we will eventually do a part two because there's so much in this book. But why it's the best book of 2022 and what kind of broke it for me is I think the first time we did a books of the year, I gave the book of the year to uh, a, a memoir called The Phenomenon, written by Rick Ankiel. So that is a former baseball player who got the yips. He basically forgot how to throw, even though he was a pitcher, and he kind of details all of it. Now, if you're a baseball guy, the book's for you. Certainly, if you're a St. Louis Cardinals fan, the book is for you. But if you're neither of those two things, the book The Phenomenon by Rick Ankiel is still for you. And the reason is, is because you deal with psychological trauma, you deal with uh, an unending psychological problem, you know, th that they're calling the yips. It deals with his relationship with his father and kind of how he even to this day is not forgiven him. Like there's so much packed into a book that I was expecting to just read about a guy that, you know, got sent to the minors as a pitcher and then came back as a, as an outfielder and the whole, Hey, look, he's a hero. Similar to this book. If you like military memoirs, this book's for you. If you're a big fan of the UFC and, and of the, the middleweight division and, you know, the, Tim Kennedy when he was fighting at 185, this book's for you. But it's also about everything else. Again, it, it detailed there in the introduction for this book or the description of the book, that, dude, he's made a bunch of mistakes. And probably more so than any memoir that I've ever read, and I've read quite a few, 
he is very upfront about how stupid he was at different points of his life in the decisions that he made. Not just, oh, you know, I zigged when I should have zagged, and here's the 10 things I learned about myself in the process. No, 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 no. The completely selfish, uh, hor- horrific things that he did, talking about wanting to kill himself and basically swimming out into the middle of the ocean and almost dying, you know, almost basically pulling that off. It- it's really a, it's a spellbinding book because again, if you are into MMA, if you're into the early years of MMA, like the real early years, this is for you. The military stuff is all there, but you're getting a guy that a lot of people that you'll hear them talk online, like, ah, oh, Tim Kennedy's a douchebag and he's this and that. And all oh, he seems super into himself and blah, blah, blah. But he even says in his books, like, yeah, I'm a cocky guy. I'm a very confident guy. But then to say that, to mean it, and then write a book basically detailing in stark detail, the horrific mistakes you've made, that is an incredibly humble thing to do. Because he could have written a book talking about all the fights he won and, you know, talking about all the military achievements and talking about how hard it was to get through the Q course, but he did it because he's awesome and all those different things. But that's not really it. Like, that's not what this book is about. Now, there's a lot of stories in this book that would be worth talking about. There's a lot of of great things to talk about. There's funny things in here, certainly. But I'm going to get into my my favorite quotes here, and it's all about one you know particular instance that he had in his life. He was on a resupply mission to a fire base or FOB or forward operating base Anaconda. So I'll read in and out, and I'll kind of get into the story here. So here's a quote from the book. It's one thing to kill a man who is actively shooting at you, or even to shoot a leader responsible for atrocities. I never lost any sleep about those shots, but these shots were awful. There was no satisfaction. There was no rush of knowing you quieted the gun that was hunting for American lives. There was just killing. With every trigger pull, I lost a little bit more of my soul. But the target calls kept coming from the RG, and I had a responsibility to keep my team safe. So they're in the middle of it right now. They're in the middle of a crazy firefight, and there's so much killing going on. You're seeing this guy, this this military, this top tier of the military guy, talking about how he's losing parts of his soul every time he pulls his trigger. And as you're reading the book, again, that's just a quote that I pulled out, but as you're reading it, you can feel it. You can feel like, oh man, he's he's actually losing a part of himself here. And during the firefight, you know, another firefight on that same mission, Tim Kennedy, who is a tremendous athlete, but very much so says, hey, the one thing that I was never good at in terms of athletics was throwing things. Like he just couldn't throw. He couldn't, you know, throw a spiral. He couldn't throw a fastball. He couldn't throw anything. But somehow during this firefight, he was able to throw a grenade, like lace a grenade into a window of a room that he thought was full of enemy combatants. And so I'll go back to the book here. A grenade going off in the movies is very different from what happens in real life. It's not this giant fireball. It's not dramatic. It's a hollow thud. It's that late night sound of opening the refrigerator to see what's in there, and the watermelon rolls out and hits the ground. That's all a grenade is after you throw it. A little hollow pop. And after you hear that pop, you either want to hear nothing, or you want to hear men screaming. You do not want to hear women or children scream. You absolutely do not want to hear that. Yet, that's what I heard. And so he's talked about this a couple times on the Joe Rogan experience. We talked about it on our show. Uh, And when you read this in the book, even knowing that it's coming, the moment that he started describing, you know, how much he sucks at throwing, I knew what was coming. (sighs) It's rough. But it's way rougher than you can even imagine. Because in the hospital room, uh, he, he's he describes this in the book. He's in the hospital room with one of the little girls, with with a little girl specifically that was hurt by the grenade that he threw. Okay, so he's about to be on his way out of there, right? And he spends some time with this little girl, and this is probably the most moving part of the entire book. That's full of great stories and moving parts. But here we'll go back to the book. I don't know if I ever moved slower. I picked her up so gently because she was in so much pain and had so many little holes in her that all that any sudden movement sent her into fits of sobbing. I had not moved this slow since sniper school. I just didn't want to inflict any more pain in this tiny little baby. I wanted to make her feel better and wash away all her suffering. After what felt like an hour, I finally had her cradled in my arms. I lowered myself into one of those tiny metal chairs the army seems to buy in bulk that no actual adult can fit in and rocked her and talked to her. I sang lullabies, lullabies. I told her stories. She finally fell asleep. And for one moment, that beautiful little girl looked just like any happy baby I'd ever held. My legs had gone numb, but there was no chance that I was going to risk moving her or placing her down. I wanted her to stay in this comfortable baby, baby sleep for as long as she could. So I didn't move for six hours. I cramped and I hurt, but it was my mission 
not to move. Eventually, everything went numb except my shame. When she woke up, I knew I had to go. I gave her a tiny kiss on the forehead and looked at her for one moment more. Then I turned, clapped the gingenator on the shoulder, and walked out. I knew I would never see her again. If I sat on that emotion long enough, it probably would have ripped me apart. But I had to shut down that part of my brain and go back into Green Beret mode. It was time to prep. I would be leaving in the morning, and I would not be doing so on a helicopter like my boss wanted me to. So, just a little background on that. Uh, they the, the mission going into the forward operating base didn't go well, and then basically his boss said, we're going to bring in a helo, we're going to get you out of there, well, we're not going to let you drive back and go through the crap again, and he said, yeah, basically screw that, I'm going to do that. So much there, so much in this book. Again, guys, even if you're not into the military, if you're not into the UFC stuff, if you don't like Tim Kennedy or any of those types of things, this is still worth your time. And so this is a good time to also uh, announce that both If the Tomb is Empty by Joby Martin and Scars and Stripes by Tim Kennedy and Nick Palmasano have been added to the 100 books that every modern Christian man should read list. So guys, if you want more recommendations like this, because, you know, I only do this this episode once a year, go to undaunted.life backslash book list. OK, so www.undaunted.life backslash book list, and you can access the 100 books every modern Christian man should read list. This this uh, list has a bunch of different categories. So there's literature, there's biographies, there's history, there's Christian, there's theology, there's all these different, you know, categories that you can kind of pick from pick from. But again, we've added Tim Kennedy's book and Joby Martin's book to the list. We're very, very happy to do that. It is a rotating list, right? So every time we add a book, we have to take books off. And I was just telling Joby this week, I was like, man, when we take a book off, like it hurts now. Like in the first few years, there were some books that I was like, oh, how the heck did that book end up on there? But now it's like, man, we're, we're having to make some sacrifices to put new books on there. But every year we will replace, you know, somewhere between five and 10 of the books with other books that we've taken in. Maybe not quite that many, maybe like three to five books or something like that. But we were very, very happy to put Scars and Stripes and If the Tomb is Empty on that book list. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to this show. But we are going to do a quick resilience boost before we let you out of here. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got a link to the Origin website so you guys can go pick up the jeans, boots, uh, protein, geese, energy drinks, supplements, all that stuff. Make sure you use the promo code UNDAUNTED to get 10% off your order. I've also got a link to the donation page on our website. Again, guys, end of year giving. We would love to have y'all support what we're doing here to equip men around the globe to push back darkness. But again, right there, we've got the link to that. And then I've got links to everything that I talked about on this podcast. So I've got a link to every book that I've mentioned, right? I'm pretty sure. And then I'm going to link to any of those podcasts that were with the author where we talked about that book. So this is probably the most links that we've ever had in a single show. So you can get that in the show notes and check that out. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness. Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Judah.